we have some questions here. Uh, we're going to ask for the mics. And uh, of course, uh, so there's one here, one here, and some two over there. So if you can bring the, the mics, please. Here, Mr. Gruffa, and then there are two more over there. Thank you. I'm asking all the panel, what do you think will be the influence or the fact that today on, on globalization, on the fact that today, a matter of fact, anybody can buy anything through the web and pay with uh, uh, Bitcoin or with all the other Bitcoin, yeah. Bitcoins, all the other uh, coins to which are exist, which means the meaning of today of globalization is much less because everybody can buy anything from whatever he wants. What do you think it will be? The world is changing, and I don't know if the governments are taking into consideration the fact that, as a matter of fact, now even we're speaking about banks, so Facebook mm -hmm. making his own bank, Apple open his own, own, own currency, own bank. Yes. on currency you can pay, mm -hmm. you circumvent all all the systems. What will be the influence on, on the in, uh, in general globalization? Do you think that governments should, uh, the, if they would, if they would, they should discuss? Any changing, any changes in globalization because of the fact they have no control anymore of anything that's going between countries. Shadow trade, Gabriel. Yeah, so, so there's, there's been a long history now of uh, thinking in the WTO or in, the, in Brussels or in Washington to rewrite trade law, no? that to take into account those new channels of distribution, for example, e-commerce uh, or, uh, or, or these, these, these um, uh, emerging uh, technologies. Uh, but we have not made any progress there. Uh, and there's, there's something that I think is very important in this entire conversation discussion to remember that uh, uh, policies matter, tariffs matter, but over history what has driven globalization much more than tariffs has been technology, has been the invention of the steamship, has uh, been the containerization of international transportation, has been the automation and digitalization of logistics, so this is more important. Uh, than tariffs, and uh, so if you talk about the future of globalization, uh, this will be probably made as much by technology uh, as by as by politicians. Mm. Mr. Bar, I want to add one thing. Uh, you, you mentioned about new new uh, phenomena, but the WTO uh, they started so-called Doha Round from 2001. Until now, we didn't do anything. Uh, we couldn't do anything. Not we didn't do. We try, but we didn't do anything. But uh, because of that, uh, we cannot accommodate to the, you know, the new, new development in the world, world economy. But the thing is, WTO's decision-making mechanism among 164 countries, they only decide based on consensus. As long as you know, one country is objecting to some idea, we don't do anything. So WTO has been extremely outdated. I agree with you, mm -hmm. but in the future, Without changing this you know, decision-making mechanism, we cannot do anything. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's very clear. So, yeah, a question Can here. Oh, alors, Carl, and then the question. Allez-y, go ahead. <laughs> so it's not outed, okay. Yeah, no, and one should not fool oneself. Uh, having a few reforms uh, wouldn't help at all when you don't have the willingness to cooperate. You, you can design new rules, but if you have no willingness to cooperate, it doesn't work. What uh, Mr. Bach says is completely correct, but uh, in addition to what he observes, we now have a number of uh, working groups on issues like uh, e-commerce, investment facilitation, on small and medium-sized enterprises, on domestic regulation for services, which are no longer aiming for consensus, but which are run by a limited group of countries between 56 and 85 uh, who are aiming at designing rules and do it in such a way that latecomers could join, but they do not want to be stopped by those who have no positive agenda. So things are happening. It is not all gloomy. Okay, so next question. Well, uh, thanks to the panels. Thanks to you, Virginie. Mm -hmm. uh, I think... Uh, there's more bad news. I'm the one who believes that things are not going to get better, regardless of what might be the outcome of the election, for one of two reasons. First of all, I, I agree that it's probably very difficult to get some sort of agreement between China and the U.S. before the U.S. election. The Chinese may be also hoping that things would be better with the next administration, so they are not necessarily in a rush to sign something. But I would like to take one or two very short examples. I was in Canada early October last year, when the USMCA was approved by Canada. 
And one of the things that was, and that was on the uh, Canadian media, not the fake news from the US, the <laughs> Canadian media. And they were saying that one of the reasons why Trump was happy with this agreement was that for Wisconsin, which is, as you know, a dairy state, there was an increase of 5% on the milk product that could be exported to Canada. So it was marginal, but it was something that could be used during the campaign to say, I've done something for, the, for these people that you were talking about mm -hmm. who are feeling that free trade and globalization is not working to their best interest. The second remark that I wanted to make is it's not just trade, it's also market access. And I agree with you again, Marcus, when you say that the important stuff is transfer, forced transfer of technology or intellectual property. We talked about that, but nothing has really happened. At the same time, there's been significant steps taken in the US in the CIFIRS Council for Foreign Investment in the United States, taken by limiting access of Chinese and other foreign interests in so-called security sensitive area, and we've seen some of this. And that's, you know, if you can't export, you can always say, I can make an acquisition or I can set up mm -hmm. a business abroad, which give you the same market access. But if you, at the same time you impose higher tariff and also restrict access to certain sectors of the economy, things are getting much worse. Yeah. And the last thing, I a slight disagreement with you again, I'm not picking on you. <laughs> when you say, when Trump pulled us off the TPP, the TPP was never passed. He pulled us from the Paris Accord, from the nuclear deal, but the TPP was not passed. And in spite of Obama at the TPA, he didn't use it because at that time, as you well know, Bernie Sanders was against it, Elizabeth, um, Hillary Clinton was against it, and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. And I agree with you. I mean, when I look at the Democratic side, Warren and Sanders are going to be worse than Trump on that score. <laughs> OK. So uh, just uh, two quick questions, one here, one here, and then one here. We don't have much time, so um, if you don't mind going fast. The, the question is uh, precisely on uh, this key factor, which is the evolution of the US in the coming uh, months you know, and, and two years. You know. And first, uh, so it is a question mainly uh, uh, targeted towards uh, Marcus. You know. <laughs> uh, and the first question is, do you consider realistic that we have a scenario in which in case of uh, difficulties, uh, which uh, during the campaign, or of beginning of a recession, or a, a stock market decline, uh, Trump will do everything possible to have a final agreement with the Chinese, not a temporary one, and he, he could be ready to sacrifice what I would call the structural part of uh, the U.S. demands, I mean uh, technology extortion uh, uh, and, for example, uh, IPR, etc., uh, in order just to increase uh, your Chinese imp uh, U.S. exports to China. And, uh, so do you think it's a scenario? Because I know that, uh, I heard that Lighthizer is, was, is fearing that and he's ready to resign on that, which will be not the first, not the last to resign from this administration. <laughs> the second question is after the election, in terms of scenarios, for Trump, we see very clearly the only thing one can say that he would be even more unleashed than he is now, especially with trade. Everybody agrees on that. What could you say what about the President Warren? You know, because we cannot rule out Elizabeth Warren. She is really the leading candidate. You know. So, okay, so two questions. Uh, is he going to have a deal at all costs? And what would Elizabeth Warren do? Okay, so uh, the issue with Trump is could Trump, uh, in the interest of getting elected, uh, sort of sacrifice a really comprehensive structural agreement with China just to take some kind of market access deal and, and declare victory? Of course. And in fact, I would say he's likely to do that. Uh, that's, his, that's been his pattern for three years. He makes, he makes grandiose statements and claims, and then he settles for small deals mm -hmm. and then tells the, the American public that he's, you know, he's done a great job. I mean, he did this, I mean, the first deal with China was a deal that Obama negotiated and then Trump took credit for it. So yes, of course that's what he'll do. The, the question is then what does he do next? Because the problems don't go away. With respect to Elizabeth Warren, she has um, uh, released a very detailed proposal on trade policy. It's on her website, and I would just recommend you take a look at it. Um, 
the thing about um, Warren, you, you know, the way I would describe it is, with the Republicans, you get protectionism. With the Democrats, you get trade with social work. So yes, we will have trade with you, but we want to fix your human rights, we want to mm -hmm. fix your environment, we want to fix your labor Wages. laws. We co it comes with a lot of baggage. And if you read Elizabeth Warren's policy proposals, uh, I personally find them disturbing because they assume a lot of capacity in developing countries that I simply don't believe is there. And while she may be genuine and sincere in wanting to eliminate child labor and improve labor conditions and human rights and the environment and everything else in these countries, uh, the US uh, trade system is a complainant-driven system. And once you put in a law that says, you know, if, if Ghana violates some kind of labor standard, then it can't get access to the United States market, Whatever the motivation of Elizabeth Warren and her team was when they put it in, I can guarantee you that American textile producers and the textile workers unions will be hiring investigators and lawyers to go <laughs> scour Ghana and find some violation of this law, which then can be used to block access. Mm. So, you know, one last plug, since I plugged Elizabeth Warren, this is much more important. I do this stuff professionally, and I can't follow it the ins and outs and what has been delayed and what has been raised and what has been lowered and what has been postponed and what has been brought forward. My colleague, Chad Bown, has a completely reliable timeline that he maintains on the Peterson Institute website. So if you want to know what's going on with US trade policy, where the current state of play is, and how we got there, go to, to PIIE.com and look for Chad Bown's uh, <laughs> trade timeline. It is, it, is, it is absolutely indispensable mm -hmm. for this set of issues. Mm -hmm. That's very true. Okay, we have one minute left, so I'm going to choose someone, and it will be the last person is going to be you in the front because you haven't talked at all since uh, this. No, no, this man in front because we've heard you before. If it's okay, and this is the last one. Yes. Uh, Professor Machereau, uh, senior fellow at Policy Center for the New South. Je vais parler au français. J'adresse ma question à Monsieur Karl Bronet, et je sais qu'il comprend le français, qu'il parle très bien en français. Alors, la perspective d'un blocage de l'organe d'appel par les Américains paraît presque inévitable et lourde de conséquences. Est-ce qu'il n'y a pas dans l'enceinte de l'OMC une réflexion à revenir à la pratique du GATT avec des working groups comme étant une alternative, euh, même si cela comporte l'inconvénient de revenir à cette notion de euh, diplomacy-oriented system than rules-oriented system Et Merci. The answer is uh, no. Because what was uh, happening in the olden days, you were making deals irrespective of what the legal situation was. Now, um, the rule of law prevails. What are the thoughts on what is happening when the, appellate, uh, when the appeal function goes away is threefold. One could make a public statement um, as a party and invite others to join that one will not appeal. Whatever case will happen for a transition period, one will not appeal. Um, the European Union and Canada have uh, set up uh, something that is um, an arbitration built on Article 25 of the uh, WTO uh, rules on dispute settlement, and that resembles in the fashion that the Europeans have chosen very closely the appeal procedures in the appellate body. And the third is, of course, that uh, people appeal to the Nirvana, and then um, the um, first instance uh, decisions cannot uh, enter into force, and people do what they want. And for me, this is a regression of civilization. <laughs> uh, and that's going to be our last word. So it's a little sad, but uh, thank you very much uh, for all our panelists and, uh, and talking about trade and WTO.